you change the way you see things, the things you see will change. I thought that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard in my life the first time I heard it. So uh, I was in banking for 15 years. So there are several that work in banking or work with banks. I was in banking for 15 years. And part of my job when I was in banking is I would be sent to different workshops, different seminars, and uh, I would bring back information. I would package it, and then I would teach it to employees at the bank. And uh, in my role at the bank, uh, I was sent to a, to a seminar out of Harvard based on the book, The Happiness Advantage. Um, has anybody read that book, The Happiness Advantage? If you haven't, I'd highly recommend it. Um, but this instructor, she goes to the front of the room and I'm at the back of the room with my boss and she's, she, this is how she ch started her talk. If you change the way you see things, the things you see will change. I laughed out loud. I nudged my boss. I said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Can I please leave? And she said, if you want to be fired, I was like, fine, fine, I'll stay. But I stayed begrudgingly. I like had my arms like folded and I was like really mad that I had to be there for this positivity workshop. I was positive. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so I was really upset that I was in a positivity workshop and uh, within about 20 minutes, Within 30 minutes, I realized I was leaning in and within an hour, it was hook, line and sinker. It was done. Like I was in love with this idea that when we change from negative or neutral to positive, how our results will dramatically change. I, Cause up until that point, I just thought you get incremental change. You can get incremental business change. You can get incremental change or incremental raises. You know, in the banking industry, we got 6% raises year over year. And I thought those were absolutely amazing raises, 6%. And, and I, I just accepted it. And what I realized is that I was not alone. And, and I call this living an accidental versus an intentional life. And so I want you to think about that for a minute. Am I living an intentional life or am I living an accidental life? So I, I want participation here. I would love to have you participate with me. What does it mean to, to live an accidental life? Like, what does that mean to you? And, and if there's anybody on chat, they can put it in the chat box. That's fine as well. So Ashley, you'll, you'll get my chat box. Yeah. What does it mean? Okay. So to be acted upon instead of purposely acting. What else? Thank you. Beautiful answer. And what else comes to mind? Yeah. Not having a plan, like being okay with whatever happens. Okay, no, no plan. Being okay with whatever happens to me. It, that's feeling powerless, like I can't change it. I'm just going, it's gonna happen and there's nothing I can do about it. Yes, powerless. It is what it is. Like I I've and for me, what I felt in my life is I had this like newfound passion of teaching and and it was like, oh, I want to do this the rest of my life, but I felt so confined. I felt I was in this box. It was like, yeah, but I've been 15 years in banking. My income is raised to a level that there's no way I could possibly go and you know create that income somewhere else. So I felt like I was just in this box and, and I was just gonna be beholden to this box for the rest of my life. And I guess I wasn't, I wasn't okay with that. I wasn't okay being, holden, being beholden to limits. And, and the presentation or the title of this presentation is living a limitless life. Like, what are the limits that we have on ourselves that, quite frankly, we probably didn't even put on ourselves? We just have them and we believe them. And that's just the way things are. And, and so when you get into this idea of like, there's an accidental life and then there's an intentional life. And intentionality is where I look at my life and I say, what do I want to create? And, and not only what do I want to create, what do I want to create that's so big that I have no freaking clue how to do it? That's when you get like into the massive inspiration. And I didn't even know that like, cause everyone told me like, Tony, be realistic. Like you gotta be realistic with your goals. You gotta be realistic with your life. You gotta be realistic with the next step. Like don't do anything dangerous. Don't do anything dangerous. Don't, don't disrupt the apple cart. You got a really safe job. You know, you, you get weekends off guys. I got Columbus day off. Like I had it good. Okay. Really safe, really secure and really limited. And what I found is that there was this voice inside of me. There was just this thing inside that says, Tony, you're created for more. Every day I would walk into the bank. Every day as I walked into those doors, I felt it in my chest. It was like, there's something more. You are created for greater impact on this planet. And then guess what I did to the voice every day? 
I'd stuff it down. Not today. And the reason why I would stuff it down is because I didn't know what more was. It was like I kept getting this like thing in my chest that says, you're created for more. It's like, yeah, but what more? Like, I didn't know what what more was. And, but I started to just lean into, okay, well, what if I designed more? What would more look like if I designed it? And that's what I want to do with you today. If you'll play with me for a few minutes is I want to just design more. And what would it take to play that game of more and limitless? Can we all play that game? Or do you want to play with me for a minute here? Is that cool? Okay. So how many of you wake up with that desire for more? You, you kind of like, I want to make more. I want to love more. I want to travel more. I want to um, spend more. I, I like how many of you woke up with a desire for more this morning? Okay. Each of us, because we're human, we have an essence to who we are that is always for fuller expansion and greater expression. The essence of who we are wants to grow and wants to express. Can you grow by doing what you've always done? Is there any growth in doing what you've always done? No, it's pushing the boundaries of what you've done. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your income for 2023. Y'all have that in your head? Don't write it down. Just kind of put it in your head. Y'all have the income for 2023. Maybe we go to 2022 because that might have been a better year because it seems that 2023 was like a down year in the real estate world and the building world. So just take in the last couple of years, like take your income, your average income that you've made over the last couple of years. And I want you to add a zero to the end of that number, not the beginning, because that would be pointless, okay? So add a zero to the end of your number. And I want you to just take that in your head. And I want you to imagine that we're gonna make that number in 2024. What comes to your head when I say that? That we're gonna take that number and we're gonna make it in 2024. What came to your head? No. Why not? <laughs> Two zeros, then we're okay. I was like, Q1's already over, so... Q1's already over, and I don't know if I'm on track for 10 times more. But what comes to your brain when I say, in 2024, we're going to make 10 times more than you've ever made? 10 times more. What? It's nuts. How many of you had that feeling? This is completely bonkers. Like, this guy's off his rocker. There's no way. Okay, what else? What else comes to your brain when I say, we're going to make 10 times more in 2024? How? How many of you were locked into the how? Like, I don't know how. So here's something that I know about life is when we don't know how to do something, we connect our ability to it. I don't know how, therefore what? I can't. And part of figuring out how is the fun. Did, did Henry Ford know how to create a car? Did he have all of the mechanisms and means and ways that he was gonna do it? Like, was it all like, did it all like make sense to him the moment he had the idea of a car? Did the Wright brothers, did they know how to create a plane? Did Steve Jobs know how to create the first smartphone? Did he know how to do that? Like, no, no one knows how to do it. They just know they can. It's like, no, I don't know how, but I know I can. When we believe we can't, we won't. You might want to write that one down. When you believe you can't do something, I can't, you won't even try. Your brain shuts down. That's the actual science. The actual science shows that when I believe I can't do something, I won't even try. Like there's not even an idea that will come into my head when I believe I can't. So what else came into your heads? 10 times more. We're going to do 10 times more in 2024. Any, any other thoughts? I can't, or that's impossible. I don't know how. No. Okay. Why do I want to work 10 times more? Why do I need 10 times more? What's, what, what am I trying to get? You know what I mean? I got okay. to the point in my life where I was comfortable with what I made, and I'm like, do I want to spend that time? Or do I want to go and work my ass off <laughs> more? Like, what's the point? So here's the, here's the dichotomy, and you just nailed it. This is awesome. So like, why? Why would I want to do this? Why would I want to work 10 times more? So immediately, what was your name again? Tim. Tim equated income with work. Did you guys see that? And I said, you're going to make 10 times more income. And immediately Tim, time, Tim went where in his head? I have to work what? 10 times harder. Yes. So there's these beliefs that we have that we created that we didn't create that limit us. 
And one of the beliefs that limits us, because let me ask you, are millionaires and billionaires working, spending their time working for their money? No, they're golfing. They are not working harder, they're working less. And they're making more. How does that happen? Like that is like in my brain, it's like how, how do you make more by working less? Because when we're this big and you go to mom, you say, hey, mom, can I have that dollhouse or can I have the scooter? Or can I have the things? Guess what mom said to you when you were this big and you started to learn about how life really is. And mom says, you have to work what for that? Hard for that. And when you're in high school and things aren't coming easy, it's like, yeah, high school is what? Hard. And we have this idea that it has to be hard and I got to work hard and I have to earn it. And if I don't earn it, then I don't get it. And so there's so many deep, deep rooted beliefs that we hold that what happens if we were to just let those go? Now, some people would argue like, well, then nobody would work hard. Okay, working hard is important, but how many of you would love to work less and make more? Okay, again, working hard is important and I would love to work less and make more. My brain doesn't compute that though. It's like, no, Tony, you don't want that. You want to work hard for your stuff. You want to work hard for things because that's where the value is. That's where you get hard work. And that's where my brain is like, okay, maybe. I've never done the other way. I've always been taught this way. I don't even know what the other way looks like. Tim. If you do it that way or do you think of it like find something that you enjoy to do? Like I look at Jeff. He works all the time but he enjoys doing it. Let's say you have 10 hours in the day. Maybe what I don't want to do is spend my 10 hours showing houses, but maybe I want to spend my 10 hours networking and setting yeah. up meetings. And, because Jeff works all day, but it doesn't feel like work to him because he loves it. So if you find something, maybe you're, you're working the same amount of time that you're enjoying it, so find it. And I would just ask, like, if today, and this is what Steve Jobs would always say, he said it in this commencement speech at, at Stanford, Steve Jobs shared, if today were the last day of your life, would you want to do what you're about to do today? And if the answer is no, two days, too many days in a row, something needs to change. And most people, they wake up, they go to a job they don't like. They do things that they don't want to do to make money, to be able to pay for the bills, to be able to do the things that they want to do. And it's like, now I don't believe that in this room because I do believe that like anybody that associates with Jeff and is really in this real estate game and enjoys it, like it's, it's fun and it can be fun. And then there's hard times. It's like, it's not so fun anymore. And I want you to think about like, what are the things that light you up? Going to the bank every day, it was awesome. I loved it. Great opportunity. But there was something inside of me that says, Tony, you were created for more. And this is not where you're supposed to be. So I had to make pivots in my own life to say, okay, well then where is that? And what is more for me? What is more? I know I made it for more, but what is more? And I had to discover that. And now I love it. Like if, if today were the last day of my life, what would I, what would I want to do today? This. If today was my birthday, where would I be? Happy birthday. This, right? For those that can't see, my birthday is on the, like, it's my birthday today. And where would I be? Like most people's like, oh, it's my birthday. I'm taking a day off. I'm going to go do things for me. And it's like, no, like, I love this. This is what I'm going to do every day. So here's some, here's some income statistics. The reason why I shared 10 times more is because it's measurable. You can measure it down to the penny and it's limited. You can limit it. You can limit yourself with income. So I want to share some statistics that, that I think will help you understand how income works. Okay. So income, I, I've studied the Census Bureau for the last like two or three Census Bureaus. Does anybody know what the Census Bureau is? It's done every 10 years. So there was one in 2020, one in 2010, one in 2000, one in 1990. So I've studied like the last four and the trends are the same when it comes to income. So the incomes have changed because inflation and income's gone up for households, but the trends are the same is what I've seen. So I wanna to talk to you about the 2020 Census Bureau. So this is just four years ago. So the Census Bureau, they go around and they survey all the households in America. They survey based on race, they survey based on uh, income, children, religions, all of those things. That's what they survey. And then they bring all of that data together. So it's pretty accurate data if you did the survey and if you were honest in the survey. So if you make $100,000, 
what, as a household income, what percentage does that put you in in the top what percent in income earners in the United States of America? Top 10%? Okay, any other thoughts or ideas? 5%? 5%, okay. Puts you in the top 9% of income earners. 91% of America makes less than 100 grand a year. Okay, as a household income. 91% of America. Only 9% makes $100,000 or more. So of those that make it to 100,000, let's call that number, let's say that number is 100,000 people. We know that it's way more, it's in the millions. Okay, but let's say it's 100,000 people. Of these 100,000 that made it to the low six figures, how many of them will make it to a half million? So they, they, they pass the 100,000. So how many of them go on to the half million versus stay at the 100,000? 8%? Of, the of, of these, this, this number right here. So of the 9%, what percentage of those people make it to the half million? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Less than 50, 3. Any other guesses? 25%. 10%. That means 90%, 1%, yeah. Nine, nine, that means 90% of those that made it to 100,000 stay at 100,000. And the trend shows, because I've done now trends from 1990 all the way through 2020, is that they stay there for the rest of their lives. Why? They're comfortable. So there's comfort, there's comfort there. There's beliefs that people hold. There's limiting beliefs that people hold. Huh? W-2 job, okay? Th that has a lot to do with it, by the way. Um, there's, so the, the percentage that actually make it is 10,000 people that make it to that half million. 90% don't make it there. Here's one of the mentalities that I've seen that keep people stuck. And it's the, I'm better than most. Can't you just be grateful? You are super blessed. You are better than most. Don't, don't shake the apple cart here. I was one of these people, by the way. In the bank, I made 100000 just over $100,000 a year. And I was going to be happy that if that was like the rest of my life, like I was planning on retiring one day as a CEO of the bank somewhere, making maybe a half million, maybe, if I was really lucky, like 30 years later. And I'm wondering, like, why not now? Why not today? Why am, I, why am I waiting for 30 years from now? And the reason why is because like, well, I don't want to disrupt the apple cart here. I don't want to do anything. So I'm better, I'm better than most. And that's how people stay stuck. You have an essence to who you are that wants to grow and express. Whether you call that spirit, whether you call that essence, whether you call that higher self, I don't care what you call it. There is something inside of each of us that wants to grow constantly and wants to express consistently. I just didn't know what growing and expressing really looked like, okay? So if we take this number, 10, 10%, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch gears to golf because that's what I did for 15 years. I was really a golfer. That's what I was when I was in the banking world. Let's get real. <laughs> I was just a golfer that, that titled myself a banker. So I'd golf three times a week and go out golfing. How many golfers do I have in here? online type in me if you're a golfer online okay so we got a couple of golfers jeff are you a golfer jeff's not a golfer he's not a stick okay okay how many of you have putt putt golf before has anybody putt putt golf before okay miniature golf that's what putt putt golf is miniature golf okay what's the point of golf what's the whole point of it get the ball in the hole in how many how many shots as few as possible now every hole has what's called what obstacles and a par, okay? So every, every hole has a par. And the par is, on average, for this hole, this is how many shots it should take you to get the ball in the hole, okay? So on a real golf course, on a big golf course, the average par for every hole is four. Now, there's some that have three, there's some that has five, but on average, it's four for 18 holes. So if you take 18 holes and you multiply it by four, that means, on average, if you're a really good golfer, you should shoot 72, does that make sense? That's four times 18. If I'm shooting 72, that means I'm really, really good. 
In golf, they have what's called a handicap. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and explain a handicap. A handicap is on average above 72 what I shoot. So if I'm a 10 handicap, then that means on average I shoot 82, not 72. Does that make sense? This is kind of layman's terms for, for handicap. There's a couple more things that go into it. But it's on average how many above par do you shoot? So if I shoot 92, then that would make my handicap what? 20. We call those sandbaggers for those that are in golf, okay? You got a 20 handicap. If I shoot on average 78, what, is that, what does that put me? A six. If I'm a six handicap, that puts me in the top 10% of golfers in the world. Once I hit a six. That puts me in the top 10% of golfers in the world if you are a six handicap. That means on, you know, on average you're shooting 78. Now what's the goal of the person that's shooting 78? What do they wanna shoot? 72, so what do they do to try and get down? What are some things that they would do to try and get down from 78 to 72? What do you think? Huh? Cheat, cheat. cheat? <laughs> yep, some of them will try and cheat. That doesn't go very far because golf is a really honest game. So what else will they do? So they're gonna improve their swing, they're gonna, they're gonna go, and how would people, like if I'm gonna improve my swing, what should I go do? I gotta go practice. So I'm gonna go to the driving range, I'm gonna go to the golf course, I'm gonna go to the putting green, I'm gonna practice. And how often do you think a person that's shooting a 78 is practicing to get down to a 72? Yeah, they're, they're on the golf course all the time. Now, what percentage of those that make it to a six make it to a zero in their lifetime? They go to the course every day. They're at the course every day. They're, they're putting the time in, they're putting the effort in, they're, they're golfing on the weekends, they're doing the stuff, but what percentage of them get down to a zero? 10%. I hope you're seeing the numbers here, 10%. 10%. That means 90% of the golfers that make it to a six never make it to a zero. But they spend the time. They go to the golf course. They're putting in the time. They're putting in the effort. They're, they're making the swings. Like they're trying to do it. And it doesn't do anything. They'll get to a three. They might get to a two, but they never get to the zero. Now, I have the opportunity of coaching professional athletes now. It's awesome. Now that I've left the banking industry, I've been out for about 10 years now. I have the opportunity to go and, and coach NFL athletes, Olympians, golfers, all different sorts of people. And I do it when they're leaving their career. And, uh, and so I took the top golf instructor in the world. We were at an event. We were at an event together. And I was like, all right, I need your help. I've got this conundrum in my head and I got to figure this out. Can you help me? He's like, sure. I said, so I have studied this and I realized that like golfers, when they get to a six, they don't get to a zero and they spend all this time trying to get to a zero. Why? Why do they not get there? So that's easy. He's like, well, teach me. This is the best golf instructor in the world. And he said something that completely changed my life. And you'll probably want to write this down. He said this. They don't realize that the swing that got them to a six will not be the swing that gets them to a zero. And they're unwilling to sacrifice their swing. Let me repeat that. They don't realize that the swing that got them to a six will not be the swing that gets them to a zero and they're unwilling to sacrifice their swing. Why are they unwilling to sacrifice their swing? Because they're better than most. I'm better than 90% of the golfers out there when I get to a six. Why would I want to change that? Why would I want to shift that? Why would I want to suck for a little bit? Because guess what? If you hire a golf instructor and they're going to rip apart your swing, what's going to happen to your game for a little bit? You're, you're going to stink for a minute. And they don't want that. So they stay average. They stay better than average. But they don't go to excellence. They don't go to mastery. They don't go to like, hey, I, no, I want to master this. Now, there's some that it's like they're not getting paid. So it's like, what's my effort? But they're going to the golf course every day. So it's like, if you're going to the golf course every day, why are you, like, aren't, isn't it to improve? Isn't it to like get better? And if you talk to all the golfers, there is a few of them. I mean, I talk to a lot of golfers and there's a few of them that will say, yeah, I just do it for the fun of it. I love golf and I just do it for the fun of it. But if you ask most of the golfers, they go to the driving range to get better. They spend their time on the golf course to get better and they don't. Yeah. 
Tim. When they're going to play golf, are they just playing or are they drilling? Like when you go to work, are you just going to work, going through the motions, or are you studying? Are you doing your coaching? Are you doing whatever you can to improve? Are you getting the mastery, or are you just going through the motions? And I want you to think about in your own life. Are you willing to put the swing that got you to where you are on the altar of sacrifice to get you to where you want to go to develop a whole new swing? Because guess what? I found that it works here as well. The swing that got you to 100,000 will not be the swing that gets you to half million. It's not. It's a different swing. However, those that make it to a half million, what percentage of them make it to a million? What percentage of these 10,000 make it to the million? 25, 10. Eighty percent. Eight thousand of the ten thousand people that made it to a half million get to a million. Here's what I've now understood: the game that you play at a hundred thousand is a completely different game beyond that. But the same game is played here that's played here. It's the same swing, but the swing that got you to here will not be the swing that gets you to here. But the swing that gets you to here will be the swing that gets you to here, and it actually gets you to four million. Then there's another swing change that has to happen at 4 million. And then there's another one that happens at 12 million. And then there's another one that happens at 60 million. So I've gone through and I've studied when, when do the swing changes have to happen to go to the next level? And there's different swing changes. So for our last couple of minutes together, can I share with you the swing change that has to take place right here? The things that have to take place at 100,000. Can we go through that briefly? Is that, is that okay? Okay, so on a piece of paper, this model is probably the most important model I've ever come across and created and studied. So you're gonna draw a little cloud, you're gonna draw a heart, and then a box and put little hands and little legs on it, that's you. I know, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> this is a beautiful drawing of you. This is how you function, okay? So this is Psychology 101. Psychology 101 that says that what I think will cause what? How I feel. And how I feel will cause an energy in my body that will determine how I act. And the energy, another word for that is attitude. So some get spooked by the word energy. Attitude is another word. Okay. Have you, have you guys ever worked with somebody that has a like horrible attitude, but they're doing all the right things? How are their results? They're saying all the right things, they're doing all the right things, but you can tell their attitude just sucks about it. Versus the person that's doing the same things that has a really positive attitude. The energy with which you do things matters, not the things you're doing. It matters more the energy with which you're doing it, the attitude with which you're doing it. Okay, now above, above here, we're gonna write the word uncertainty. Are there uncertainties that people are dealing with in life today? What are some of those uncertainties? Let's just start calling them out. What are some uncertainties that people are dealing with in their own personal lives? Okay, so the uncertainty of the future. People are trying to guess what's going to happen tomorrow, next month, next year. It's super uncertain. What are some other uncertainties that people are dealing with? Financial. Am I going to be able to pay my bills today? Am I going to be able to get that check or that bonus tomorrow? We really need it for these things. So they have uncertainties in their financial situation. What are some other uncertainties people deal with? Health. Am I going to be alive tomorrow? Am I going to be able to walk again? Am I going to be able to, to recover from this health illness that I have? Doctor just told me that I have X, Y, or Z. And when is that going to happen? And how am I going to get healed from it? Massive uncertainties. What are some other uncertainties? Death. Death of a family member. Death of close friends and people. Death in general. When am I going to die? What are some other uncertainties? relationships, parenting, marriages. Do you guys see that the list can go on and on and on and on about uncertainties? So the greatest quote that I ever heard, it's probably number one on my list. I quote it every time I speak. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said that the greatest decision you'll ever make in your lifetime is whether you believe you live in a hostile or a friendly universe. 
The greatest decision you'll ever make in your lifetime is whether you believe you live in a hostile or a friendly universe. Because we have on top of here, if you write little antennae, those little antennae represent your five senses, what you see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. And, and we live in a physical world, so we allow our eyes and our ears to control a lot of what we think about and what we feel. Would you, would you say that's accurate? How many of you ever had like a really incredible day and then all of a sudden you get a text and your day goes down the pooper? Has that happened to anybody? You're having this incredible day and then a bunch of words that come up on a phone totally destroy your day? Think about that. How, how often we allow what we see and what we hear to completely alter our days. Okay, so, so if I live in a hostile universe and I see uncertainty in my marriage or with my kids or with my income or with my health, I'm sensing uncertainty. What thought does that person create in their head that has a slant towards hostile universe? Okay, it's all going to go bad. And the thought, the, the thought is doubt. They start doubting. And really it goes inward first and then ex external. So inward, I self-doubt. Can I do this? I don't know if I'm made for this. And then they'll start doubting the situations and people around them. I don't know if they can do this. I don't know if the government can fix this. They doubt. And when you doubt, you use an incredible gift that you were given when you were a little kid. It's called the gift of your imagination. And you start to imagine WCS, worst case scenario. So I have this hostile universe. I'm starting to doubt. I'm starting to self-doubt. Now I start to think about all the worst possible things that can happen. What feeling cr gets created inside of me when I start thinking about all the worst possible things that can happen with the situation? Okay. Fear and worry. I start to be afraid. I'm afraid to act. I hesitate. I don't know if I can do that. And I'm afraid. And I worry. I worry about whether my people might think about it or about me. And when I'm worried and afraid, what energy does that create in the body? Worry and fear. I heard it out here. Okay? Anxiety. That's the energy that actually gets created in the body. How many of you ever experienced panic attacks? I'm raising my hand because I've had multiple of them in my life. That's when we go down this train and we start imagining all the worst things that can happen and those fears start to crumble and they start to crumble us and we start to now feel massive anxiety in our body. Now, do people go around expressing or suppressing their anxiety? What do they do with it? They suppress the anxiety because they don't want to be a weirdo. So they suppress the anxiety, they suppress the anxiety and the suppression of anxiety turns into depression, disease, and decay. Our body slows down when we start to get anxious and when we start to believe that we want to go and, and the whole world slows down. The best description of, of depression that I can possibly imagine is Harry Potter. Has anybody read Harry Potter books? And, and there's a character in Harry Potter that's called the Dementors. Okay, that's, by the way, that's why she created those characters because J.K. Rowling went through years and years of depression. The only way she could describe it was these dementors that would just suck the life out of you. And that's what happens. The life gets sucked out of you. You start to get sick. You're not at ease. You're diseased. And then things start to fall apart. Now, according to Gallup, who's the number one data conglomerate on this planet, what percentage of the population wakes up on this side every day? 60%. 60? Any other guesses? 55. 81. 85%. 85% of the public wakes up with a hostile universe lens, thinking about all the worst things that can happen in their day, afraid to make anything, doubting themselves and doubting everything around them, anxious about their jobs and things that are going on on this planet, afraid to do anything. And, and the number one problem in corporate America today, what's the number one problem? It's the number one health crisis in America. Depression. Right now, depression is the number one health crisis in America. And we'll, we'll go deeper into this here in a second. So if this is the left side, what is somebody that wakes up on the right side that sees the same uncertainty? This, the, you can't escape uncertainty. So they have the same problems. They got the same things they got to deal with. A person that sees life through a friendly universe lens, how do they see the uncertainty? What do they think? 
Okay? They have confidence. And it's first self and then outward. They have self-confidence. They know that everything's going to be okay. They're okay. And then they have confidence and everything's going to be okay outside of me. They start to see all the, and, and instead of worst case scenario, they are able to look at best case scenario. Okay, what are the best things that can happen right now? That's the worst thing. What's the best thing? And when they start to think about the best case scenario, they have confidence in themselves. What feeling does that create which completely washes out fear and worry? There's one feeling you can have that if you have it, it will wash out all fear and worry. Love. In my head. That was what was in your head? Yeah. Should have said it. it. <laughs> you, were, you were doubting yourself. You were doubting that you knew the answer, right? There's a little self-doubt going on there. Okay, so love. Now, how many of you have been in love before? Anybody been in love? Okay, so what happens to the body? What happens to your, like, your energy when you're in love? Okay, what is it, though? Excitement. You're excited. Your body's excited. All the, all, everything's excited, and you have these endorphins that are moving, and massive amounts of excitement are going through your body. Okay, when you're excited, do people suppress it or express their excitement? What do they do with it? They express their excitement. Tell a kid to like tone down their excitement of going to Disneyland. Just tell them, tone it down. They can't. They can't tone it down because they're so excited. And when you're excited and you express it, it turns into momentum, wellness, and growth. The three most important words to any salesperson, entrepreneur, business owner, business leader. Are we catching the wave of momentum as a unit? Am I catching the wave of momentum? Are we well and whole? And are we growing? True? Guess what's over here? The complete opposite. The depression is the opposite of momentum. Disease is the opposite of wellness. Decay is the opposite of growth. So what percentage of the population wakes up on this side? 15. Now, I teach this stuff for a living, and I still wake up on the left side. I just know how to move myself to the right side. Just because you know this, just because you think this, it doesn't mean that you are exempt from waking up on the left side. You're human. You're going to wake up on the left side. And there might be days and days in a row you wake up on the left side. Do you know how to change it? Do you know how to shift it? So as I've worked with professional athletes, as I worked with NFL athletes, I'll ask some of my NFL athletes, I'm like, what's it like, like right before you go out on the field? Like you're, you're going out in front of 100,000 hostile fans that want to rip your head off. What does it feel like when you're going out into that energy? What do you think they say? What, and, and, and I say, what, what is your body going through the moment you're about ready to go through the tunnel? They're actually anxious, most of them. They actually have a lot of anxiety that's going through their body. What they've learned how to do from their coaches and what's made them NFL athletes is they know how to change it to excitement. It's the same energy. They just know how to take their nerves that everyone feels and turn it into excitement. I've spoken thousands of times. When I was sitting there in the chair, guess what I felt? Just a little bit. Felt a little bit of anxiety. It's like, okay, what am I going to say? Are they going to like what I say? I don't know. Like I'm in my head, you know, thinking about all these things. But I've learned how when I'm sitting over there, how to take a couple of deep breaths, how to move myself over to say, okay, no, I'm excited. Excited to be here. And I've learned how to move it. This is the game, by the way. You cannot play this game over here. Let me repeat that. You cannot play this game, half million or more, over here. It, when you play this game, it's because you were able to shift and play over here. And a lot of it has to do with trusting yourselves and trusting you know, the, the ideas that you have. So here's some signs. In our last couple of minutes together, I want to give you some signs. What are some signs that I'm on the left side? What are some signs I'm on the right side? Should we go there? So the number one sign 
that you're on the left side is comparison. It's the number one sign you're on the left side when you start comparing. When you start saying, I am so much better than that person. Because if I'm better than someone, then that means what? I am less than somebody else. When I start comparing money, why did they make so much money and I didn't? Bonuses, man, I made so much more money. Anytime you're in comparison, you are on the left side. Because comparison always leads to doubt. Always. And it leads to self-doubt first. Why did I not get that? Why did I not have that vacation? Am I not good enough? Why do I not have? And so what's the number one? If, that's, if the depression is the number one problem, what's the number one cause to depression? This is actual science now. What's the number one cause to depression in the world today? In at least the United States. Social media. Do you see why now? See, most people will say, yeah, don't let your kid have a cell phone. Don't let them have social media. But they'll not teach you this is why. Because social media, if I, if I see that I live in a hostile universe and I start to see all the stuff that's on social media, I'll start to doubt myself, start to imagine all the worst possible things about myself. And then I'm in fear and worry that I'm not accepted, I'm not loved. And then I go into anxiety. By the way, kids today, if they don't get enough likes, they're considering ending their lives. This is sad. That kids in high schools and kids in junior high schools, that if they don't get a comment from their girlfriend, they are literally going home saying, is life worth it? This is something that must change. This is what makes me so passionate about, like, we need to change this. We need to change and get our youth over on the left or on the right side where they are confident and they feel loved. And they know that it doesn't matter what they do or how they dress or how they talk or what they say, that they are loved. And it starts with us knowing that it doesn't matter what I say, what I do, that I am loved. So number one leads to number two. Number two, when you have this comparison, you will start to see through a lens of not enough. I'm not, a, and it starts itself. So it starts by looking in the mirror and seeing somebody who doesn't measure up. I'm not smart enough, not talented enough, not a good enough salesperson. I'm not a good networker. I'm not, I'm not enough. And when I see myself as not enough, guess how I see the world? Through the same lens. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough leads. I don't have enough business. I don't have enough potential. I don't have enough. But when you can shift it, when you can change it, there's a whole other side of living. And when you live on this side, magic happens. And it's magical. We call these people lucky. Ah, man, how'd you get so lucky? They're on the right side. So the number one sign on the right side, I know who who I am. I know who I am. Now that question could be answered in all different sorts of ways for people of religion or people of politics or people of whatever, whatever race or, or theology you have, but it's knowing I'm, I'm good. I know who I am. I don't need to compare myself to anybody else. And it, and when I know who I am, it will lead to number two. And that is always enough. There's always enough. I'm always enough. Now, a lot of people will argue with me that are over on this side, by the way. They'll argue with me. And they're like, well, yeah, well, if you're believing you're always enough, are you always going to get better if you just always know that you're good enough? It's like, yes, I will. I'm always getting better. Just because I know that I'm always enough does not discount the fact that my spirit wants more. And so I want to grow. I want to push myself. But right now in this very moment, I am enough. I'm not, I don't have to prove my worth to anyone. I don't have to sit here and prove that I'm enough to you by how I speak or what I say. I just know it. And by the way, when I know it, it's because I'm confident. When you don't know it, you're arrogant. Do you guys see it? Do you guys see the people that don't know that they're enough and have to show it all off? And the reason why they have to show it all off is because you need to tell them how cool they are. 
so that they feel like they're enough, and it's super temporary. But when you can just know it, your whole life will change. This is the game that gets played of the top 1%. As I have now, the people that we idolize, the people that we look at, we're like, man, how did they get up there? What is it that they did? The NFL athletes or the Olympians or the actors and actresses or the award-winning whatever. And we look at them and we're like, man, how did they do it? First of all, you're comparing. Second of all, they did it because they don't care what anybody else thinks of them. They really don't. When somebody told them when they were 16 years old that they would never make it to the NFL, guess what they said? Watch me. And guess what the 17-year-old that had all the talent in the world, that had all the ability to make it to the NFL, and a coach told them you'll never make it, and they were on this side, guess what they did? They quit. Because they allowed somebody else outside of them to determine their worth. Do not let other people's past experiences determine your future potential. Do not let other people's past failures and past memories and past experience determine what your future potential looks like. It is limitless. When you change the way you see things, the things you see will dramatically start changing. As I've worked now with people all across the planet, and I help them make these moves. It's incredible how their lives will change when they start seeing themselves this way and life this way. So make the shift. Start the process. Just because I spoke to you today doesn't give you like, okay, I got it. Now I'm going to just go do it. There's ways you, you can do this. By the way, I'm going to give you a little hint. What do you think the top thing you can do to move from here to here is every day? One little thing you could do every day. And if you did it every day, it would dramatically change your life. Gratitude. Gratitude. It is impossible to think about what you have and experience what you're missing. It's impossible. So when you're focused on what you have and what is good with life, it's impossible to see what's bad with life and what's missing. It's a powerful, powerful tool. Science, I can give you all the statistics and all the science around it. Um, and we'll teach that uh, at deeper levels. If you ever come and want to learn from me, it's an amazing process to learn how to start to get into the depths of gratitude. So in closing, I do have uh, an ability, um, and, and thank you for allowing me, Jeff, to be here. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you've enjoyed this and want more, I run an event called Pivot Point. We run them every month. Uh, the next one is in April. It's April 18th and 19th. It's at the... Um, it's at the Embassy Suites, just off the 106 South exit in Sandy. That's where we're going to be holding it, just right off the freeway. Uh, and we'd love to have you. Normally, the ticket price, I think, is around 1000 bucks. Uh, but for anybody in this room today or online, we're going to drop the link in there, and there's a promo code. But you have to sign up today. We're going to drop it down to 197 um, And it's two days of me teaching this. It's a powerful two days. Uh, we've had people that come, and it's like it's completely changed my life. So I'd love to invite you. I'd love to have you come. Um, Sylvia's got some sheets. She'll hand them out. So I think the price says uh, $4.97 or something on there. Just cross it out, cross out the price and put the $1.97 mark. Um, and we'd love to have you come and, and join us at Pivot Point. Uh, promo code, if you just use these papers, you just cross it out. We'll make sure that you, get, that you have that. If you're online, then we have a promo code. Just type in the promo code and we'd love to have you come join us. Uh, if you can't join us in April, but you want to still sign up, just sign up and we'll get you to another future one. Uh, we don't have all the dates on the calendar yet for the rest of them. We usually just put the next one out there. Uh, so April 18th, 19th is our next one. But uh, if there's any message I can share with you today, it's simply this. You are always enough. Doesn't matter what you're doing. Doesn't matter where you're at. You are loved and you are always enough. And never forget that. Don't let any result, don't let any other person, don't let anything tell you otherwise. We have too many people committing suicide today, ending their lives because of a deep-rooted belief that they're not enough. And so if there's any message I just want you to take home from today, it's you're always enough and there's always enough. So Jeff, I'm going to hand it back to you, my friend. Thank you.